Everyone, we are here with Hadley Austin, and she has a film coming out called Demon Mineral. It's going to be screening at Slam Dance on January 22nd um, and 19th. Um, and Hadley, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, first of all, I have to say I was really struck by the film. I yeah. thought it was a wonderfully done documentary um, and actually did what documentaries are supposed to do, which is actually just teach you, show you, um, and expose you to something that you may not know about or, you know. So thank you for that. It was really good. But um, can you do me a favor and just explain what Demon Mineral is? Sure. Um, so Demon Mineral is a documentary about the legacy of uranium mining on the Navajo Nation. And that's it in its shortest version. Um, and I guess in a slightly longer version, it is um, an introduction to the land itself and also an introduction to um, a handful. It's, of course, not even all of them, just a few of the activists who are dedicating their their lives to creating vital living space in the face of contamination. You know, there there are there are so many things going on here and there are so many questions. Um but basically to set it up, uh colonialism jumped into the Navajos uh land, tapped into something that was there for, you know, the benefit of the country and then left not cleaning up the mess so this is the issue that that it, the navajo nation is facing mm -hmm. um and yeah there are over 500 unremediated uranium mines on the navajo nation and i think it's also important to note that demon mineral only focuses on the navajo nation um but there are unremediated uranium mines by you know, the the many hundreds, you know, into the thousands up the Rockies and also around the world. Mm -hmm. So um, the scope of the problem certainly doesn't begin and end on the Navajo Nation. That's just where this film hangs out. Right. And it just it just shows one facet, one one group being affected by a much larger problem. Um, so how did you come to tell this story? Um, I lived for a very long time in a border town to the Navajo Nation. Um, the people who are in the film are friends and friends of friends. You know, our translator is my ex-boyfriend's mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, in, I think of it as a family affair. You know, if you expand the concept of family to, you know, those who are, who are close to you and your life's journey, um, and uh, it's a it's an issue that I've been uh, tapped into, sometimes actively working in, um, other times not uh, for twenty years. And I make that distinction because I think it's really important to note that like the the people who are in the film, this is their life's work. This is where they live. Um, this is what they do every day. This is where they were born. Um, you know, this is the land that that is um, you know sacred to them. And so my relationship to it is of course, like more distant than theirs. Um, but it's still a place that is very, very important to me. Um, I feel that I owe that community and that place a lot in terms of my own personal, um, you know, evolution as a person. And, uh, I'm really glad that all of us got to make this film together. And I'm really glad that, um, people can can look at the work these people are doing and understand their situation, but also um, appreciate their efforts. Yeah, most definitely. And I think what um, I think what really blew me away about the documentary was really driving home the point why they can't leave. Yeah, I, I mean, there's like there's like practical considerations that are part of the answer to that question, and then there are like uh, psychic, cultural, and spiritual elements. You know, some of the some of the practical elements, uh, you know, are of course related to poverty, um, access to resources, um, 
we all know that moving is expensive. We all know that 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 moving is challenging, <laughs> practically challenging. Oh, yeah. um, and you know, uh, these are these are a, a large portion of the Navajo Nation does not even have running water. So when you think about the resources necessary to transport your life to relocate, um, think about that as a starting point, right? Um, and then and then there are the 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 psychic, cultural, spiritual components. You know, I think that it's uh, I think that many people uh, don't carry with the they they view land as um, something to make profit off of, something to look at. They don't necessarily view land as essential to their being. Um, but, you know, obviously this is a group of people who have deep spiritual connections to the land. The land is sacred to them. They are the land. Mm -hmm. Um, and to leave it is, is to leave themselves, right? It's, right. it's, it's a tremendous and like psychically impossible thing to do. And we tried to capture that in the film. It's, it's really hard to capture because it is for some people very unfamiliar and a film is only, you know, the film's 88 minutes long. It can only do so much, but I think that the part that captures it best for me, or at least of course, because I chose to include it in the film <laughs> is when our narrator, my friend, Emma is talking about how, you know, even if, she, even if the signs noting con radioactive contamination were up when she was a girl, cause she grew up in a contaminated area. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, what we're learning increasingly is like one of the most contaminated areas in the Navajo Nation. Um, but even even if those signs had been there, she didn't know if it would make much difference because um, the it is it is who she is, and her umbil her umbilical cord is buried out there. Yeah, her daughter's yeah. umbilical cord is buried out there. Yeah. Um, her dad's umbilical cord is buried out there, um, and and it, and it almost wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter because the land is so important essential essential to who she is as a person uh another thing that really struck me about the film was uh the cinematography um why did you choose a range of looks um and why did you specifically use black and white in particular scenes um well so the the film's dp uh is yoni goldstein and that black and white that you see is infrared black and white. And that was actually Yoni's idea. Um, and it was it was a good idea because we had really been struggling. Um, the thing about uranium mining is, is most uranium mines aren't super visible as mines. Um, a lot of uranium mining is what's called soft shale mining. The mines don't, you know, they just sort of blend into the landscape. And so, you know, it was hard to show the danger of it. And then there's also the reality that that the true danger of these mines is invisible, right? You can't see radon gas with the naked eye. And um, even uranium, it's not this like glowing yellow, you know, shocking thing. I mean, like I've held uranium rocks in my hand. It's the color sort of varies depending on like the density of the ore and whatever, but it's like kind of a brownie yellow, you know, kind of a blonde right. color. I know, kind of a color you've seen before. <laughs> yeah. That's weird. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so that was part of the reason was to, was to explore the invisible danger and to give people a sort of sense of unease, but also um, it's beautiful. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to use that black and white because this land has inherent value. It is not some irredeemable, like, you know, barren landscape that isn't worthy of our love. You know, it's gorgeous. And uh, it is, a, it, you know, the infrared black and white is really pretty. So in addition to, to capturing radon gas, which it does, if you look at the bottom of the screen, sometimes people think it's heat, but it's radon gas. Oh, um, so that's why... <laughs> okay, so is that why in that one shot with I think it's Tommy? Uh huh. That's it yeah. Kinda, like uh -huh. it, it. Okay, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes radon gas, to be clear, is naturally occurring, uh, but a lot of times it's built up in the in the mines, and they haven't covered the ventilation shafts, and so it's coming up out of the ventilation shafts. So, um, 
Yeah. But uh, yeah. And I guess the final reason, I just think this is important to say, because I nerd out on, on history things. It's um, this, the landscape where Tommy is from that shot that you're referencing specifically was made famous in John Wayne films. That's many people's first introduction to this landscape. And those were shot in black and white, largely. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were shot in color. So some of it was also kind of um, like embracing Demon Minerals anti-Western kind of attitude um, by acknowledging this history. So the black and white was doing a lot. The reason the interviews are in color is that twofold. Was <laughs> Yeah, um, is because um, a lot of times in people's homes, the 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 risks are a lot lower. Um, you know, the their their home is literally providing a, a shelter from a lot of the radioactivity, um, and this is a good thing. Back when I was younger and first starting this work, a lot of a lot of homes out on the Navajo Nation were actually built out of rocks that had been blown out of the mines. Uh -huh. um, and so there were these uranium rock houses that um, the good news is I looked for some to film for the documentary and I couldn't find one. That's good news. Wow. Okay. Uh-huh. And so, but, but uh, anyway, so indoors is, is safe. You know, if you're in your, if you're in your not uranium rock home, you're, you're not, you know, you're not totally safe, but you're much safer. Um, so that was part of the reason. The other reason was practical um, in order to shoot infrared, you need a lot of natural light. Um, yeah, for the sensor to work. <laughs> and so indoors that, um, that also wasn't going to work, but, but really our, our thing was sort of like, um, land that's been, that's been a sort of abused <laughs> land that's been like used in this way. And therefore sort of like offers up risk of uh, this danger, this radioactive danger will shoot in infrared black and white and, um, and it will be beautiful and, and, but it will also sort of reflect that, that history. Um, and then where it's, you know, a little bit safer, you know, it's in color. Kind of felt like a visual Geiger counter, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, very, very well done. Um, I think to me, one of the most, I, well, there was a lot, <laughs> there's a lot in the movie, but one of the things that struck me the most was how they pointed out that yes, you've heard of Three Mile Island, but you've not heard of this. You know, and and it's true, and it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, but what is what is the message that you want to get across? Is it a message of hope? Is it a message of understanding, activism? What is it? I I will say I think everyone who worked on the film kind of wanted something different. Um, none of it was in conflict, you know. But I think everybody was sort of focusing on something different. What I was looking at was was what has just begun to happen in the last couple of months. Um, when I, when we started the film, um, both Australia and Canada had largely limited their uranium mining and exports. And this left Russia in control of most of the world's uranium exports. Um, there was also this huge push within the Green New Deal towards nuclear. Um, I think for, for all of us who have, who have lived near uranium mines, we've, we've seen this happen before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was like, well, they're gonna, they're gonna reopen some mines. I mean, the price of uranium is going to go up and, um, they're not going to want to import via Russian avenues and new mines new mines are going to open and old mines or zombie mines, which haven't been fully decommissioned are going to be reopened. Mm -hmm. And, and this has begun to happen. Um, there are three new uranium mines, um, in the last couple of months, the first U S mines in the last eight years, I think, um, that have opened up around the edges of the Navajo nation. Um, and, uh, just last month, uh, there was, uh, um, um, it, a bill was passed to, ban Russian uranium imports and the price of uranium has multiplied by three. So, yeah. um, and, and there's also a proposed new mill in Southern Utah, um, and new mines proposed in Wyoming and Colorado. And I think that what 
is very important for people to know. I mean, people should should be informed, right? I think people should should be making and and um and and choosing what they support based on you know on on the on information. And I think what people aren't often told is that the the sort of green part of of nuclear is is like a tiny segment of that fuel chain, and the front end of that fuel chain, which is extraction, and the back end of that fuel chain, which is storage, are not super green. And they require fossil fuels, and they m make places incur contamination, and we all pay the price. Um, and so that was that was part of what I wanted to do. But also part of what I wanted to do was just acknowledge and celebrate the work that these people have been doing for generations. There are people in the film of all ages uh, and every single one of them has, this is their life. This is what they do every day. And it's what they've done every day since the time they were very young. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're wonderful people and they're just kind of doing their thing, you know? And it, I felt so bad for Tommy in that one scene with the Congressman. Uh, Go Sar. Did not like that. Um, anyway, so. It was hard to edit. That was the hardest scene in the film to edit. Uh so um yeah so this is is there is there is there a solution i think that uh the where we start with a solution is no more uranium mining <laughs> um i think where we go from there is making a viable cleanup plan because at this point it would take over at the rate that they're going on the Navajo Nation alone, it would take over 2,000 years to clean up wow. all those mines. And I think it's easy to look at the situation and go, it's hopeless or whatever. But um, I think some of that feeling, you know, is like created by things like, you know, like Nixon called this area the sacrifice zone. You know, it's like, you know, this is sort of like a, it's like a, it's like a, we've inherited this thought that like we can't fix it um and also another reality to remember is like you can always improve on something <laughs> you can always make something better <laughs> well no, that's exactly it that was my next question is like you know obviously the demand for uranium is not going anywhere it's not going to you know how how do you make it work how do you is there a way to make it work or is the answer just to stop well, this is like like a like a huge question, right? About it's like it's got a collective answer. Oh. Um, I, I mean, I do think it's worth acknowledging that, like, you know, as as long ago as 2015, there were like respected papers coming out um, in like the National Academy of Science that were that were saying that like it is possible for the United States to function on a renewable grid, renewable not including nuclear, renewable right. including um, mostly solar and wind, but mm -hmm. hydro is included in that study um, by 2050. Uh, these these non-nuclear renewables have gotten a lot more efficient in the last 20, 30 years. We are not talking about 1960, right? Mm -hmm. um, like we're no longer in a situation where nuclear needs to be leaned on and so the it's it's coming from a place of finances it's coming from a place of money. well yeah that's that's all it is that's right all. so it's yeah it's not coming from a place of actual need and so right that the solution is that we collectively insist uh -huh. on on better and i think it happens probably in a lot of small ways you know i think it's like local communities rejecting a mill or local communities rejecting a reactor or local communities insisting that something, you know, flows, you know, like, I think it also, you know, obviously like how we vote isn't nothing. Um, the things that we say are important matter, at least to the degree they matter. I, I mean, and so I think that that's, that's the thing is to just not give into nihilism, <laughs> which is really hard. <laughs> which is so easy. Um, so <laughs> I guess my last question would be, who, who is it that you want to be seeing this film? Who's your target? 
obviously I want everyone to see the film. Um, <laughs> but I think that, I think that um, people who are sort of public policy nerds, you know, I want them to see the film. Um, I want, um, I want people who have never been to the Navajo Nation, don't even know what it is. I want them to see the film. You know, I want people who don't have any tie or connection um, to this place that I love to like learn to love it as much as I do, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, you know, I want the folks on the Navajo Nation to see it. Um, that's very important to me. You know, we're doing our best to bring it there too. Um, I want lawmakers to see it. I've invited as many people to the screenings as I can, <laughs> as many of these decision makers as I can. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, are you going to, are you going to be on the ground at slam dance? I will. I'll be Excellent. at slam dance. So will I. Yeah. So oh, I, great. Hope to, yeah. I hope to be able to say hello to you in person. And yeah, too. Um, yeah, everyone, I know we got kind of, you know, deep into the discussion, but that's kind of the point of the movie, uh, demon mineral and, uh, Hadley Austin, writer, director of this documentary, uh, Thank you so much for creating something that is provocative and 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 instigates conversation. Thank in a you way. so much. Um, yeah, it's such a big deal to me when people even watch it. <laughs> no, it, it was it was very well done, very well done. Um, and everybody, check it out at Slam Dance, January nineteenth and uh, January twenty second. And if you're not in town, get it online. You can you can look at Slam Dance online. So. Uh, Again, thank you so much, Hadley. And thank I can't you. wait to uh, see you in Park City. Same. All right. Bye. All right.